Hello and welcome back to Sharks Happen. We are going to go over six more species of sharks. The stats we have on those are probably about 40, 40 attacks or so that we're going to cover, maybe, maybe a little bit less. So stick around to the end. At the end we'll talk a little bit about how you can possibly prevent a shark attack, at least lower your odds by staying out of the waters in certain conditions, doing certain things. Uh, so it's going to be a good show. I hope you stay with us. Okay, now that we're back, we're back into these shark stats here. And uh, I went back through the great white because we went over the bull shark, which uh, one out of five attacks, 22%. It severed an item off the person. I didn't on these attacks, I think with the bull shark and, and also the tiger, I added in some of these that were total where the, they were gone. I'm gonna take those out next time so that they're gonna be separate when I go through those, like I did with the great white here. The great white has a lot of them where the person is gone. I didn't count those, but I did go through the great white because the tiger had 33%. Uh, the great white, 26 times of the 170 that we have, they recovered the body. So 26 out of 170. 15% of the time, the great white uh, severs an item. So we're gonna get into the bronze whaler now, now that we have all the stats done for the big three. Um, the big four is in here. We're gonna get to the oceanic white tip too. Uh, I would put them in with the big three as the dangerous sharks for people. The other ones, not so much. You're gonna end up wounded usually, usually not a fatality. It depends on circumstances though, but these sharks usually do not try to eat you and I don't think we've came across one that has yet. So we'll start with the bronze whaler. Uh, it comes in fourth in attacks that we've covered. It's 11. Uh, no fatalities and no attempts to predate. Uh, we did cover one where they thought it was a 13 foot or a 12 foot bronze whaler that bit the legs off of a, uh, off of a surfer, but they changed that to it being a great white, so that's over in the great whites. Um, as it's zero severed, it hasn't severed a hand and a foot, nothing. Um, seven of those 11 attacks happened in the PM, in the afternoon. Two of them were in the AM. Two of them are unknown, so might be that they're surfing more in the afternoon there. Uh, maybe to weather, like I like to golf when it warms up in the day, and a lot of the time you have to wait until noon at least for that to happen, so maybe that uh, would explain some of that afternoon attack there. I don't think, plus we haven't gone through enough, but even if it did come up to more PM, it could be a, a weather type thing. Um, six have been spear fishing of the 11. Three have been surfing. One was swimming and one was free diving. So that's the attacks on how they happen. 10 of them were in Australia, one in New Zealand. So Australia doesn't have, I don't think that they have the lemon shark, which is pretty prevalent in the U.S. as their shark, the bronze whaler is. And that's a good trade-off for the U.S. because you'd probably rather run into a, a lemon shark any day than a bronze whaler because, you know, a bronze whaler is big and uh, kind of like a bull shark. It's a cousin of the bull shark and uh, probably could do the same kind of damage bull sharks do. Uh, you don't hear about them removing a lot of flesh, though. They don't seem to be attacking, and a lot of them, like we said, a lot of them are on spear fishermen and surfers. So they're brought in probably on the spear fishermen by the fish and by the activity in the water. And the surfers, well, it sounds like the bronze whalers hang out in the surf looking for their prey like the great white does, and that's what ends up with the, and the same type of get out of my water attack, not I'm going to eat you attack. Um, and then 10 were on males, one was on a female. A surfer. The female was a surfer. And then two of the attacks were from a six foot bronze whaler. One was from a seven foot bronze whaler. Three were from an eight foot bronze whaler. And two were ten footers. Three were unknown as far as the length of the shark. That is our stats on the bronze whalers so far. We still have many more attacks to go from them. We have many more attacks from all these to go because we're about a quarter of the way through, if that. So we have years of this still to go, <laughs> unfortunately for you all. Uh, <laughs> the Mako comes in next with eight attacks that we've covered. One fatal, two attempts to predate, and uh, 
on that fatality and attempt to predate, neither are the record number of bites, which is Beatrice Aharonovich with 12. That, uh, that was in Israel. Um, 12 bites, not fatal, no flesh removed, just a mad shark, and that's what they seem like. Uh, but one of the attempts to predate, I do, uh, I do recall, is going to be uh, Yevgeny Trishkin, and the way I remember these attacks, there's something in the story with the name that reminds me of Frederick Bergstaller was when he punched at the shark and lost his arm. Uh, with, with Yevgeny Trishkin, it's that he saw dark water almost black, he said, and he swam into it. <laughs> it's like, I think I put that as a mention of what were you thinking, but that sticks with me because of what he did. Um, so that's how I remember these names. It's different with everybody. Um, as far as distance from shore, one was within a quarter mile, and I believe that was a spear fisherman that had this six or seven footer that came and tried to attack him and never was able to bite him through the whole situation. He was able to keep it off of him, uh, I believe with his spear when he was out a quarter mile off, but he's the one who swam in and he got in, the shark fought, trailed him the whole way, trying to make a run at him every now and then. And then when he got out of the water, that shark was acting crazy. That's that story. Uh, so that's the, the one with the quarter mile. The rest, five or a mile or more, and two we don't know. So you're going to run into them in deep water. Um, I think that's obvious with those. And uh, three were in Egypt. One of those was fatal, and two were attempts to predate. Um, one was in New Zealand. One was in USA. One was in the Bahamas. One was in Israel. That's the record number of uh, bites to survive. Uh, 12, and then uh, one in Venezuela. Two had severed items, so uh, the Mako has severed, I think, a leg. Um, both might be legs, part of the leg. So uh, it, it, the Mako, you know, it's one of those mackerel sharks, and it's got pretty strong jaws, even though it's got those pointy teeth on, you know, it does have some blade-like teeth, and obviously with the shaking and the biting, it can probably just take whatever it wants, whenever it wants, like any large shark probably can do which they decide not to. Um, three of the attacks from the Mako were on swimmers. Uh, zero fatalities, one attempt to predate. One was on free diver. Uh, one was on snorkeling, that's the other attempt to predate. And that's one spear fisherman, one standing, and one windsurfing. All right, now we get to the oceanic white tip with five. So now we're into about 25 attacks, 26 attacks between these three species. They had five, but two of them of the oceanic white tips are fatal, and four times they attempted to predate, and that's Olga, and that's uh, Lloyd Miller, and the woman that was over on the other side is probably in there now that I think about it, because I was thinking about Makos when I'm thinking about those when I was talking Makos. So you don't want, and the other one's Rodney Temple. You don't want to run into these things. That's 80% of the time that they run into people and attack them that we've covered that they go ahead and try to consume them or consume them. Two fatal, one of them Rodney Temple and another one over there with uh, the woman that was at the different beach than Olga and Lloyd Miller. Uh, the visibility was 35 feet in two of them. It was 150 feet in the uh, other two. Uh, with the fifth one, we don't know what the visibility was. I, I would think it's clear too, and I would think that divers that dive would say 35 foot visibility. I would call that good visibility. Four were in Egypt with one of those fatal three attempts to predate, and one was in the Virgin Islands. And three out of the five attacks had a severed limb, so that's 60% of the attacks from an oceanic white tip that we have covered, you end up with a severed limb. Okay, now the the gray nurse. I actually looked into the gray nurse, and there's five attacks, but two of them are provoked. So five total we've covered, two provoked. One of the provoked was a diver in an aquarium. Uh, four of the sharks were under 10 feet. Uh, one was, we don't know. Three were in Australia, and two were in the USA. Two were on spear, spear fishermen. One of those was provoked, so he must have... I, I, if I remember correctly, they they shot the shark first. Um, might have been out there trying to hunt sharks to catch the you know kill a shark, and it bit one of them. So we have one on a, a commercial diver that was diving an oil rig. We have one on a fisherman from a boat. 
but that was an attack. That shark landed on him, so <laughs> that was the one where a gray nurse jumped out of the water and landed on this guy on the boat. Uh, and one was in the aquarium, like I said, that was provoked. That's the stats on the gray nurse. Um, the lemon shark, there was four attacks, none of them fatal, but one was an attempt to predate. Three were in the PM, we don't know what the other one was. Three were in the US, one was in the Bahamas. Uh, three of the attacking sharks were in eight feet or less water. One was in deeper water, so the lemon shark's gonna get you close to shore. Uh, two less than 10, f 10 feet long, two we don't know, so smaller sharks, of course. And then one was severed, and that was, uh, I believe it was a spear fisherman, yeah. No, we don't have a spear fisherman. Maybe he was a snorkeler, but I remember because he called it a copper shark, and it bit him, bit his uh, arm off at the at the mid middle of his forearm. So that surprised me that a lemon would do that. But it was a cop copper shark, and he knew his sharks. So a lemon shark can remove your arm, part of it, if it wants to. I think that was a larger shark, though. But they didn't give the size exactly. Uh, the hammerhead is the next one that we're going to go over, and there's three attacks we've covered with zero fatal and zero attempts to predate. Uh, two were in the PM, one we don't know. Uh, one was on a free diver, one was on a swimmer, and one was on a surfer. Uh, three were in the USA, all three of them that we've covered so far, and all three sharks were less than 10 feet in length. Now we get to the black tip, and this is a shark, one of two that make New Smyrna Beach the shark capital of the world. They are smaller sharks. Uh, I believe the black tip goes to about eight feet in length and the spinner is very similar in length and both not really life-threatening sharks and you're pretty much playing in their territory if you're in the water in New Smyrna Beach. During the times that it's warm that's when their bait fish are in the water and we'll get into that uh, four attacks, zero and zero. One was in Bermuda. Uh, three were in the USA. Uh, they obviously like the warm waters over in that area. Um, all six to seven feet long that we've covered. There's been smaller ones that don't make our stats because you have to be six feet long. Uh, three were in the afternoon, one we don't know. One was spear fishing. One was swimming. One was surfing. And one was playing in bait fish. So, that is the top six of the remaining uh, shark species that we've covered the most on the, on the channel. As you can see that, you know, the, the only ones that are going to sever anything, the lemon shark was able to sever something, and then you have the mako and then the big three. Oh, and the oceanic white tip. So, five sharks are known to sever arms and things like that. Uh, these black tips, I haven't even found severed fingers from a black tip yet. I mean, we've only covered, um, we have, what, four of them on record that were six feet or over, so we probably covered about seven of them now. And I always try to cover my spinners when they pop up, so I can use my spinner shark, that right there, my spinner shark uh, video on that. So we're caught up on the stats now. Uh, the next time around, we're going to get into that some more. Okay, before we get into discussing maybe ways so far that we can see where we can lessen our already low percentage chance we'd run into a shark and maybe get attacked. Uh, before we get into that, first thing I want to say is uh, happy 38th birthday to Gabe Fugler. Uh, yeah, I did see the comment from your wife, so uh, I want to say happy 38th birthday, which is on the 20th, I do believe. So that's it. Happy birthday to Gabe. And then I wanted to say that uh, I'll be coming out with a regular attack show in a couple days from now. We'll be back into that. And like I said, we're going to be going through that for months before we ever get back into these stats. We'll have at least a thousand attacks by then. H. David Baldrich had a thousand attacks when he was looking into things. So we'll be right along the lines with him in hopefully three, four months. Uh, now, when you know we've gone over these shark attacks, uh, there is, um, first of all, a high humidity little thing jumping out of these stats so far. Not, we don't have enough stats to say that it's a thing. Um, maybe keep that in your mind that 
it's like five to one high humidity to low humidity attacks that we have the stats on. Um, I'll have to see if I can get the stats for the rest of that. But there's other things you can do. Um, a lot of these, especially those three feet and under bull shark attacks, um, those are murky water. That's not going to happen if you see, you know, if it was clear water, you'd be able to see a shadow in the water. These things would not be happening. Most of them are murky water or let's say uh, some of the dark Atlantic water off of like New Smyrna Beach where you can't really see through the water very good. It's hard to see a shark in that situation. So they got to be murky water attacks on these, on these ones that are in three feet of water or less. So you want to make sure you can at least see uh, the seafloor where you're standing. Uh, if you can't get into shallower water, that's the only way you're going to guarantee that something's not going to get up on you and you not know it. Uh, we covered that one attack on that with the father and his son, two sons were with them, and a wave came in. They were standing and the kid was splashing in the shallows, they said, and a wave came in and the kid disappeared. And he happened to see the shark taking him away. That, that's insane. Standing in the shallows and a wave comes in and you can't see that a shark's in it and it ends up grabbing your boy. Um, luckily, he noticed it and was able to grab his kid from that shark. So, uh, you know, if you can't see the seafloor, get into some shallower water or wait till another day to go in it. Uh, abide by these signs. A lot of these stories we have. Uh, like over in, I believe it's Reunion Island. It's either there or Brazil where they have, I think it's Reunion though. Some of the beaches have like black seafloor. Well, you're not gonna be able to see a shark without having a, a light color of the seafloor to be able to reflect off of it. So you wanna be able to see the seafloor with clarity of water, but you wanna make sure that you have a light color on the floor that's gonna offset any kind of a shark that's dark that's gonna come in. You'll be able to see a shadow a lot better and it'll give you time to get out. And I would stay in shallow enough water to where you can get out of the water quick. And to me, that's you know knee deep at the most for me. And even then I found out when I tried to run out of the water when I stepped off the dock or yeah, stepped off to the dock that even in the probably two feet of water I was in, I, it tripped me up and I fell. So, uh, if I couldn't see the seafloor, for sure I'm not going to be in up to my shins because it could trip me up. <laughs> then I could become a Julia Painter and have some little six foot great white shark attack me and take my arm and take my leg. I think it took both of our arms. Uh, that was a real crazy attack. So um, you want to worry about those kind of conditions after rains, after storms. You don't want to go into the water. Uh, it's probably just like with fishing. A lot of, a lot of soil and, and insects and things are going to be washed into the water during that storm. So the storm is over. The fish are hungry. So the little tiny fish are eating all the little things that are in the water, bugs and things. And then you got the fish that are going to eat those uh, little minnow type, you know, shads and things that are going to eat those. And you're going to go all the way down the line. Everybody's hungry. They probably haven't been eaten during the storm. So they're all going to be feeding afterwards. So after a storm, it's not a good time to be in the water. Swells come up a lot and attacks when it's out in the ocean, in the open ocean type thing. Um, this could be the bobber effect. When you have a bobber and you have your bait underneath it and you have little waves, that gives action to the, to the bait to where you don't have to sit there and do any jigging with the line. Uh, the bobber does it for you. That's kind of what swells do and those are round waves. They're not the ones that are pointy and curl. These are just round swells and they're the aftermath of storms usually. And uh, they kind of probably do the same thing for sharks and kind of bob you up and down and give you more action than you normally have. Um, you know, I see it in, in quite a few attacks, but not enough that I would know that it happens. But maybe if there's swells, wait until it's a little calmer. Um, and, you know, your piers, your, your marinas, your jetties, um, all those things you... you you got to be just be aware. I mean, um, the thing is, is they're rare even in those cases. The jetty, uh, the jetty we just covered on the Australia attack, I think it is, um, not the one that bit in the face. The one I covered in the show, we went over that one, and they had uh, just sea urchins and slugs. I got to get her name because that's never going to leave my head because of sea urchins and slugs. 
So that attack. The sea urchins and slugs do this daily, every day. She's been doing that probably all her life, or at least since she's been there for years. Never attacked. Finally, there you run into a shark, and I guess it's kind of rare to run into a shark there, but it can happen, and it can happen anywhere. So, uh, but jetties pop into our 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 stories enough for me to say to myself, I'm not going nowhere near that. <laughs> That's it. Don't swim under docks. Uh, like I said, don't enter marinas. Marinas usually have uh, charter boats and charter boats are cleaning and dumping you know, the remains of the fish guts over, over the water. That attracts the sharks. Um, and be with people. You know, have people with you at all times when you get into that water. It, it could be you going to the hospital and you know going through whatever you have to go through but living and not making it uh too many attacks happened to where the last one i know of i think it was the moro beach one where the guy was out there he was bitten a leg i believe and he passed away i think if you know at least if he had somebody with him he has a shot so don't go in the water by yourself i mean it's shocking i have to say that <laughs> To me, anyway, because you should always have somebody with you in those situations, especially, and, and and if you're going into the water, and I'm sure surfers do this stuff, but if you are going into the ocean on a regular basis, uh, maybe learn tourniquets, how to put on a proper tourniquet, and how to, to release it in certain increments, like we've I didn't know about until I ran into that. Uh, the more of you that know CPR and tourniquet use, the, the better it's gonna be for everybody that's out there, the more people that are gonna survive. Um, and then hopefully we'll find out what's going on with these sharks over in Australia. Just off the charts, I'm telling you. Yeah, a couple other things that I forgot. <laughs> um, also, you wanna make sure that when, when you run in, you're in the water and dolphins come up, you know, go close to shore, get away from there. Same thing with turtles, same thing with fish. Get out of their area. There's going to be sharks there. That's like the one attack by the black tips where they were standing in bait fish. <laughs> That's what you're doing. You're just making yourself bait. Um, so you're just increasing the odds that you're going to have another accidental attack, which uh, accidental bite, which is what New Smyrna Beach is. It's filled with accidental bites because the people are out there where the sharks are. Also, I had a comment that Warren Smart. And I thought about that, and I'm like, the name sounds familiar, and I'm thinking Robin Warren from over there in, uh, in Hawaii, which I got to look into. But Robin uh, Warren Smart sounded familiar. As soon as I saw his photo standing there holding the two fish, I knew I covered him. And I do have to add him. He is a fatality. He is a spear fisherman fatality uh, over in South Africa. So it's the only spear fisherman fatality we have. But it's not an attempt to predate, and it's, it's nowhere near an attempt to predate. It's the usual, so quick. Um, he did pass away, but you know the thing is that I'm shocked about with the spear fisherman with the bull sharks is that he's the only one that passed away because they got to take a boat ride to get them in. It's not like they're getting on the beach and getting help. You've got to get in a boat and get yourself in before you get aid. Um, like I said, people are going to do some first aid on you, but you need to get to help as soon as you can. So it surprises me not more pass away from their wounds from them, but what really shocks me is the way that the sh bull sharks do. And he was telling the paramedics as they were working on him that the shark was after the fish. It wasn't after him. And I do believe that the shark was after the fish. For the most testosterone shark, they act like all others when they're out there biting at spear fishermen because they want the fish. Um, they're not interested in a person, they're interested in that fish. And with, with a lot of those attacks, I bet they would not even, even happen had the fish not be involved or the fishing not been involved. Um, it doesn't matter whether the fish is speared and it's up and hanging from a float or whether it's speared and it's wriggling around. It has already happened. The shark has already probably sensed it and already on the way. Um, surprising surprising that they don't go after the people they go after the fish and they end up getting the people but it's real quick and done and I don't know if the boat jumping off the boat was a bull shark but I mean you land on a shark it's gonna bite you up and we went over a tiger shark that did that to somebody they landed on the shark when they jumped off their boat 
That thing turned and bit him like five times. The chest, the leg, the arm. He got bit up pretty good, but it wasn't taking anything from him because it was a defensive action. It was a fight attack, which territorial attacks are, and not a feeding attack. So we had to get that in there. So now that I've got everything covered for the show and for the stats, I will say to you until a couple days from now, if you go into that water, you are much more afraid of them sharks than they are of you.